Hello, everyone. My name is Sine Jongestel. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Group Now. Um, and I'm excited to be here today at the Iceland Travel Tech Conference speaking to you all about how to move forward and discussing it later in the panel as well. Um, and I think this is a really important conversation to have because in many ways we all feel a little bit like we're either in full stop mode or in pause mode, um, or this is difficult. Uh, and we just want to fast forward to a future uh, ahead, a future much better, um, or at the very least uh, press play uh, and start reimagining, start rebuilding our destinations um, in a new, better way with innovation and sustainability. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So let's just get straight to it. I will share my screen with you here. Um, because I think many, many of us feel like this. We feel that we're sitting at home, just looking at a screen and waiting for the future to load. Uh, and so why even discuss this? Well, it's important to have this conversation because the future is not set in stone. The future is something that we can reimagine together and we can rebuild, reshape. And that's really what today is all about. Um, looking ahead, though, doesn't mean not looking back and learning from the past. And I think this is one of the most important lessons of the past, illustrated in what must be one of the world's most famous graphic illustrations um, of flatten the curve, but this is the tourism version. And basically, the key message here is that we learned and we have learned over the past years that there is such a thing as too much tourism uh, in order for uh, local communities, destinations, local livability, natural habitat, cultural heritage, and so on to thrive. Um, and so, before that, there has been a tendency to look at tourism as something we just needed to maximize, um, tourism growth as a goal in itself. I think over the past years, we've increasingly had discussions and learned that uh, that is not the sustainable way forward. We need to flatten the curve of tourism growth in line with uh, the destinations, in line with the environment, in line with local communities, um, to make tourism not something that is despite of or separate from uh, local lives or local environments, but in fact, something that supports and sustains it as well. You could say that we actually don't want it like this. We want it more like this, where the tourism is more balanced throughout the year with no high seasonality, um, as you can see on the high curve, but below tourism carrying capacity, of course, throughout the year. This would also be more sustainable for tourism businesses moving forward. So this is the key lesson that we take with us from the past. I'll get back to a little bit more of the lessons from the past. But I think let's start off with the optimistic um, message that most of us have seen from Italy. Now, I don't speak Italian, but I know what it means. Everything will be okay. And I like this message and I am optimistic as well. But I do have one condition. I think everything will be okay unless we repeat ourselves. And so that's what today is also about, taking lessons from the past in moving forward. I'll talk about rebuilding our destination. I'll talk about that through these topics, through the travelers, where are the travelers at? What are they thinking of traveling right now? The destination, how do we open our destinations and stay open moving forward? The Corona narrative, what is now the perception of tourism and the perception of our destinations in the minds of both travelers and locals? And finally, the goal of success. Where do we end up? Where do we want to end up? So let's just dive in. First off, the travelers. Now, I collected this, what I call, oh, the memories of the past days of travel. And it does look like a very long time ago, right? So this is in front of Mona Lisa at the Louvre um, with a packed room with tourists taking pictures. Or you see from Venice, a packed city of visitors coming into this historical place or the Blue Lagoon in, in Iceland, perhaps a little less packed, but still loads of people um, enjoying this uh, wonder. And uh, below to the right also, you just have not an overcrowded room, but just a full room of convention delegates. Um, and, and looking at this, it does feel like it's so long ago already. Over the past few weeks, we went from, in many places, over tourism, in some places, just a lot of tourism, um, to no tourism at all. And so these days of the past should stay with us in moving forward. I'll get back to that as well. But now, of course, we're dreaming a little bit. Of, uh, we're dreaming again of going back to the days of traveling. We want to return to discovering the world, visiting each other, um, and and learning new things. Um, 
And we can see that, of course, we're expecting that first to be primarily domestic, regional and long haul. So this is an expectation that is um, more or less all over the world, the same idea of how we will start to travel again. And we see that nearly two thirds of US travelers can't wait to travel again. And 75% of Europeans actually think that international travel will resume by October. But at the same time, we cannot deny that this happened and is still happening. The pandemic is upon us. So when we talk about before and after Corona, I think we need to realize that we're talking about after Corona as in after we experienced Corona for the first time, after we realized there was such a thing as a global pandemic. And then we can talk about a an after or post vaccine scenario, which is, is something different much further ahead. But just uh, facing up to the fact that there is such a thing as Corona, and that's also influencing not necessarily how we dream, but how we act upon our dreams. Now, only one in five Britons actually want to lift lockdown, and 63% of Americans don't want visitors in their own communities right now. Now, why is that? You can say you can see that actually from this word cloud. This is uh, from um, research done by destination analysts in the U.S. Uh, a survey, a weekly survey they do of 1,200 U.S. travelers, where they've asked uh, for one word from Americans that uh, best describes how they feel about travel right now. And I don't think it takes a very sharp analyst to identify the key word here, but I highlighted it anyway. And the key word is, of course, scared. People are scared to travel right now. And this impact or this factor of fear is something that we need to take in consideration in terms of how we rebuild our destinations in the coming weeks and months and years even. And we see the same in, in this survey of Oliver Wyman of Chinese travelers. Um, this is of the 37% of Chinese travelers that say they plan to travel less post-pandemic. Um, the key concern is that the virus might come back. 78% of Chinese travelers say that they plan to travel less because they are afraid the virus might come back. You also have 58% that point to financial distress. But on the optimistic side, or perhaps on the other side of this, you have 47% of the respondents that say they will not change how they travel, and you even have 12% of the Chinese travelers surveyed that say they want to travel more. And what are they dreaming of? Because this is also interesting in terms of how we open up destinations and which destinations can actually expect um, what kind of travelers. Uh, this is a list of dream destinations uh, in Chinese travelers. This is based on um, research done by China Academy of Social Sciences um, um, via Dragon Trail Interactive, uh, where I came across it. And, and this is, these are the destinations that Chinese travelers dream of pre-virus and post-virus. Uh, and uh, sorry, and what you can see is that pre-virus, US was the top destination that everyone was dreaming of. Um, whereas if you look post-virus, the US is not even on the top 10 list. But new destinations like Switzerland and Iceland in number six um, is really now on the dream destination uh, list of Chinese travelers. Now, this is interesting because why these destinations? I think part of the answer comes here from a survey of US travelers. And the reason why I skip between US and Chinese travelers is because we're actually in somewhat of a unique time period where we've all experienced the pandemic on our lives. And so I think it makes sense to look at different nationalities of travelers to see how they are motivated or not motivated to travel and their perception of tourism in general, um, because I think it will be indicative of how other people will be traveling as well. Now in the US, and this is again destination analysts data, um, US uh, U.S. travelers answer that they won't visit any place where there's a lot of people, spending more time on individual things, outdoor activities, camping, instead of relying on others to clean, or post-pandemic activities like going to the beach. It's very much outdoor. You can see hike as well, spending time with family. Um, and if you look at this one from Chinese travelers and how they view transportation post-virus, now the purple or pink one is this is the means of transportation that they will use less after the virus. And the green one is that the means of transportation they will use more after the virus. So what's interesting is that you can see self-driving, hiking and cycling is really something that the Chinese travelers expect to use much more post-pandemic. Planes more or less the same, um, but then trains, ships and tour buses will be used much less by Chinese travelers uh, post-pandemic. Um, so basically what this shows is that there is a 
desire for less crowds, less perhaps um, uh, exposure or uh, contact with other people, or at least with lots of other people, and more um, more demand, more preference for more isolated uh, sole individual or smaller group activities. Now, I know I'm speaking very fast, moving forward to what we really want to talk about is how to open our destinations and how to stay open. Um, I think there is no question that we've, we're now perceiving safety, sanitary measures as part of that uh, differently. And it's not just something we hope for, it's demanded. We want clean, contactless and crowdless as the new standard. And so you could say now safety is an expected service. Um, we were expecting clean before, but we have a completely different perception of what that means. And then, of course, in the end, safety will also be part of a control measure on how we uh, control the virus and the spread of the virus moving forward. This one is from Simply Flying, basically identifying 70 areas of sanitized air travel uh, and how air travel will change or the air travel experience will change for most of us uh, or for all of us moving forward, both with new technologies introduced in terms of uh, thermal scanners and uh, CT scans even and, and different things, uh, sani-tagged bags and so on, but also, uh, you know, in terms of not having an in-flight magazine that we can all sit and touch, um, introducing an in-flight janitor that will clean more frequently and so on and so on. So basically, air travel experience will not be the same. Also the same for accommodation, sanitized accommodation. All the major hotel chains are introducing new hygiene, new cleaning standards. Um, also working with new technology, high touch points, uh, UV light technology, um, but also taking out pen and paper from the rooms. So I think this is interesting. This is not just high tech. This is actually identifying what do we all touch um, and where are these touch points that we can just take away or change how we approach. Now, of course, there is a lot of new technology coming in that will help us and facilitate this. Um, from Aura, where here you have technology that will help you rem uh, that will help remind us of keeping our physical social distance. Um, and uh, you have here from Attractions IO, they're offering a social distancing package for attractions with uh, ticket sales, uh, tickets on your phone. Um, you can buy a time slot ticketing and ordering food in the app, virtual queuing, etc. But there are also more extensive, like you can say, cross-destination or cross-national um, technology that uh, that makes sure or controls also the spread of the virus. So in China here, you have uh, the Alipay health code. So that's Alipay working with the Chinese government and introducing this health code that is basically your access to all kinds of offerings, restaurants, attractions, transportation, et cetera, et cetera. You have to show that you have your green health. Uh, health code to enter. Whereas if you have the yellow code, it means you should self-isolate and the red code means that you've already been uh, diagnosed with the coronavirus. So this is um, what you can say nationwide technology to control the virus. But this is not something that we just see in, uh, in China. Most countries and nations are introducing different measures of um, COVID trackers or um, making sure that you know where it's, um, where it's moving and alerting people that have been exposed or will be exposed or have been exposed. Um, and so... Moving forward, technology like this will both be part of making us feel safe, but also in controlling how we move around and who we are exposing ourselves to um, or, or who we are exposing uh, the virus to. Now, it's not all technology in reimagining how we open our destinations and how we stay open. I really love this example from Lithuania, the capital Vilnius, where they are reimagining public space, opening it up and offering it, in a sense, to restaurants and cafes, making it available for them to put their tables out in a much broader space. And, and of course, with safe distance between tables, and that will enable them to stay open, um, even under measures of uh, social distancing. This example is reimagining the restaurant in Amsterdam by Mediamatic, uh, a new restaurant experience that also taps into the uh, requirement of social distancing, but offering different experiences. And I think this is really exciting about um, the period that we're moving into is not just um, making solutions that will feel half or you can say like uh, 
like an almost experience. It would have been an experience if we were not in this situation, but that, but rather reimagining new experiences that are based on the situation that we're in, but offer um, a different kind of experience. But of course, we all now have a different mind in terms of how we see the world. So it's not just what different companies can do um, to offer clean standards or different kinds of experience. There is a massive crow narrative, I call it, but the narrative of destinations uh, that come from the experience of Corona. Now, this picture is from uh, the big convention center in Madrid, the FEMA, uh, during the FITUR. Uh, in January, I was actually there myself for the first time. And so this is how it looked in January and this is how it looks now. Now we've all seen really horrific pictures around the world of different destinations and they have influenced how we see these places. Now we've also been inspired, I think, with people singing on balconies in Italy and in Spain. Um, you do get a sense of a culture that you would in fact like to experience, but we've also seen horrific images from many places in the world that, that influences how we see this destination and our appeal uh, and the appeal of the destination to travel there. I think one interesting example is um, Wuhan, the Chinese city that we are now all familiar with um, by name, um, and has of course uh, an image that has been affected by this uh, whole uh, by this whole um, crisis. Um, but what's interesting is that from the uh, data from the China Academy of Social Sciences actually show that uh, Wuhan is now ranked the number one domestic destination in China, and it's interesting. Well, of course. There is a certain aspect of wanting to experience where it all happened and also, I think, national pride in how it was dealt with. Um, but uh, I thought this was an interesting article from Skift on how new virtual tours in Wuhan are also dispelling or um, trying to work against the coronavirus city reputation, showing Wuhan from a different side with different perspectives. And so this is interesting because I think we've all seen the, we've all experienced a major rise in new virtual technologies or or just not necessarily new technologies, but the, the spread, the popularity of virtual technologies across destinations as part of this pandemic, as part of the uh, response to quarantine, how to experience from home. But how will we use this technology moving forward in reopening our destinations? And I think that's actually a really, really interesting example that through virtual tours, we can um, we can represent our destinations in new ways, dispelling coronavirus city reputations uh, moving forward. Now, Helsinki is a really strong example of working with virtual technology. Also, way before um, the coronavirus, uh, Helsinki had an ambition or has an ambition to become the virtual capital um, with a digital twin of Helsinki city center um, in, uh, in, in virtual technology. Now, what's interesting is that that's, of course, working with this for a longer period has also made them capable of really tapping in and making full use of this technology in response to the pandemic as well. And so for the May Day uh, celebration, which is very big in, in, in Finland, uh, they actually made a huge uh, virtual event, which is, as you can see, in a virtual space, but it's, a, uh, it's, it's uh, the digital twin of a very famous uh, central square in Helsinki with a huge huge concert and, and to the right you can also see uh, all the digital avatars, all the people that were there, their avatars meeting in the square. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely social distancing, um, but it's also reinventing the experience of celebration and concerts. Um, but it doesn't all have to be like huge, massive events. I think we're seeing now that virtual technology can really help us in also just everyday, um, everyday more perhaps normal activities. Uh, from a virtual NYC site tours, they've now launched that you can experience the different meeting spaces of New York City uh, virtually before booking. Now that we're limited from visiting them physically, uh, this is a new approach. But I think in moving forward, this could very well be an approach that would both be time efficient, but that would also make it more efficient to choose. You can visit more and select just the right uh, uh, meeting space for you. And you could imagine this in multiple other contexts, like before you go to a place, you can meet digitally. We've all become very accustomed to meeting in this way. Um, you can meet your host, or you can even have a virtual tour of the apartment, um, 
feel safe and reassured about the safety of the apartment and about your booking of the place before you go. So I think this is some of the things that we'll see from virtual technology moving forward. Now, it's not just the individual company uh, or the individual brand doing these things. In Singapore, they were very keen to launch a big initiative across hotels, restaurants, public spaces, shopping malls, etc., in terms of uh, cleaning standards, uh, quality marks, um, to make people feel reassured that it, it is indeed living up to a new um, standard of clean, but we've also seen just recently the launch of Clean and Safe, uh, the Clean and Safe initiative in, by Tourism Portugal, um, working with the tourism industry to ensure that they uh, that they live up to these new standards, but also, of course, enabling enabling them to do so and in telling the story, because this also becomes part of the Coro narrative. I think in the future, what we will see is that the destinations that manage the balance between positively communicating and reassuring travelers that this is in fact a safe place to visit um, without necessarily uh, coming off with a huge greeting say, oh, by the way, we're not contagious, which is maybe not the right way to uh, welcome people. Um, but this is of course not only about the visitors or the travelers, because there is also a need to feel safe and reassured as locals. And I think this is something that we have perhaps not discussed that much uh, throughout the past weeks of the pandemic. But in the uh, days of the pandemic, we did see across the world in different destinations reactions against tourists as the virus spread us. And this picture is from Bala, Wales. Uh, pandemic um, exclamation mark stay home idiot tourists and I think this is interesting because how has the perception of locals how has the perception of tourism among local residents uh, been influenced by the pandemic moving forward and I think I saw destination analyst has done research where they asked uh, Americans, how would you feel if you saw an advertisement today promoting your community as a place for tourists to come visit when it is safe? So the key word, of course, or the, the four key words here is when it is safe. So it's not a question of now, but in the future when it is again safe to travel. And if you look at the results here, what you can see is that uh, 30, so almost 31% are neutral in terms of this question, but you have almost 20% that, are, that would be unhappy to see an advertisement and almost 17% that would be very unhappy to see an advertisement uh, promoting their community as a place for tourists to come visit when it is safe. So there's a big issue of also reassuring uh, locals about the safety of visitors, of tourists coming to communities. And I think we will also see this as part of how we reopen, that there will be an initial reaction. Uh, and the more proactive we can be about that in our dialogue conversation with locals, um, I think the more successful will be our reopening. But then again, I think the long-term success of tourism also depends on this conversation, this continued dialogue with locals on the role and contribution of tourism. And that leads me to the fourth topic, which is the road to success. Now, the road to success in reopening, rebuilding our destinations with innovation um, is guarded by, well, it can feel like it's guarded by or blocked by the coronavirus, but I would say it's guarded by the lessons of the past. These are the lessons that we need to take with us. We need to um, remember and, uh, and, and use in moving forward. Now, what do I mean by lessons of the past? Well, in short, we've already seen the pictures or the memories. We've known for quite some time, some, for, sorry, for quite some time that a new business model is needed. It's urgently needed because the sustain, uh, sorry, because the tourism development that we've been seeing uh, over the past years is is most certainly unsustainable, having an increasingly negative impact on local lives, on uh, our local communities, our environments, our cultural heritage, and so on. So we've been talking about sustainable tourism for quite some while, um, but I think now. In many ways, the coronavirus can actually help us or support us or maybe just push us towards really um, rethinking how we work with the tourism business model. We will have to anyway, because before we discussed it as something we need to shift from tourism growth as a goal in itself to tourism as a means to better communities. But we will have to shift from tourism growth as the core of our business model, because in many ways, well, first of all, we, we're looking at a world that is less traveled and will be less traveled for at least the coming years. But also our individual products will be much more appealing if we can demonstrate that we are limiting 
in fact, the number of visitors to our museum or to our hotel or our restaurant. We don't want the massively crowded room. So we will have to reimagine our business model in making the exclusive or, or making the, um, the less crowded, the escapist experiences appealing to more, but also making them viable as a business model. Now, of course, the reason why we've talked about this before and we will continue to talk about it is what I just said before. We need the locals, not just on board with tourism. This is not about asking locals uh, what they can do for tourism or if or if not they like what we are doing with tourism. Tourism needs to work for the locals. So it's not about ask not or what I say is ask not what locals can do for tourism, ask what tourism can do for locals. This is about making tourism a force for good, make tourism relevant again. Um, and I think what we've known is that it takes a village and we've known this for a while as well. Tourism or the destination really is a visitor economy, or, sorry, the, <laughs> the destination is an ecosystem. And we're all dependent on each other in this ecosystem. So whether or not you have a hotel or a restaurant, you are fully dependent on the other items or the other part of your destination, because just the fact that there is a room, an isolated room with a bed is not enough to attract visitors. You need a full ecosystem for the destination to be appealing and to be uh, somewhere that someone wants to visit. And you also need the locals on board for that, because in many ways they are part of that destination. They are living there. And the whole reason why tourism is because we believe it will create better communities. And I think in many ways, the experience of the coronavirus has shown us, has demonstrated the importance of uh, the community to all of us, but also shown us um, the power of the individual uh, choices uh, that we make and that individual choices can indeed have a collective impact. Now, for the past weeks, that individual choice has been for many to stay at home, stay quarantined, um, which has had a collective impact, which has been the way that you could support, that you could, in fact, um, do the best possible for your community and for your society. Now, I think that mind shift is something that we should, uh, that mindset is something that we should take with us moving forward. Um, because we will need to change the way that both that we travel and that we see travel and tourism, um, not just based on what the travelers do and what they demand, but also from the provider's perspective. Now, I've talked before about code breakers and innovators because I do think that reinventing our business model, we need code breakers. We need um, we need companies, we need uh, individuals that break with the code of their DNA and reinvent how they work with it. Now, KLM here is a really good example. Uh, they closed their route between uh, Brussels and Schiphol in Amsterdam uh, and and instead put in together with the... Um, uh, the Dutch railways, they put in a train uh, on the same route. But what I've also seen during this coronavirus is code breakers throughout the past weeks and months of the pandemic. Now, this example is from Thai Airways, and Thai Airways actually changed their loyalty program to award miles points um, to their um, to their customers who are staying at home. So what you could do is you would enter your, loca your location, your GPS location, and if you stayed within that location or 100 meters within that location, you would earn miles that you can then later on spend on traveling when traveling is once again safe and allowed. I think this is really clever because it's both reinventing your relevance, it's supporting its tie always supporting a community society priority to stay at home, but it's also business smart because it's uh, encouraging people to then travel again when there is in fact, um, uh, when there is in fact a time to travel again. And so I think the road to success is paved by this. The road to success is paved by innovation and collaboration and the development of a new business model. And we've seen throughout the corona pandemic that tourism is in fact able to uh, reinvent their relevance in support of a much larger agenda. Um, and so I think we should take that moving forward because the road to success is paved by our shared responsibility to people, place and planet. And the old measures of success in terms of quantity in terms of bed nights or visitor numbers is no longer viable. And so we need to invent new measures of success, not bad business, but new ways of doing business, more healthy, sustainable business models that support our overall much more important agenda of people, place and planet.
So we all knew that the old model was broken. And so let's fix it. And then everything will be okay. So let me just stop sharing my screen. And instead, thank you all for paying attention to me for this long now. I'm looking forward to uh, the panel discussion that we'll have later on, um, where we can further discuss some of the ideas and topics that I presented here. Thank you very much.